Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Bob Craddock. I'm a uh, geologist here at the Center for Earth and Planetary Studies, which is located here at the Air and Space Museum. Um, I've been here a little over 20 years, and during that time, I've actually have come up on the learning curve of some of our artifacts. And what I'd like to do is talk about some of the stories behind some of the artifacts today in the little bit of time that I actually have to do this, this lecture. We have thousands of artifacts in our collection. And believe it or not, even the smallest artifact typically has a very cool story behind it. So I'm only going to be touching very small pieces of it and, and talk about some of my favorite artifacts here. Now the title of my, my talk is, is We, and that was inspired by Charles Lindbergh in the book that he wrote by the same title. This is the second book that he wrote. The first book that he wrote was about the spirit of St. Louis and the sort of the effort that uh, he put together in order to build that, uh, that airplane and fly it across the Atlantic successfully. Now, it's, this is an interesting title, as it could mean any sorts uh, of different things. But if you open the book up and you look inside, there is a picture that he has in here that has the title We in, in quotation marks. And it's a picture of him in the spirit of St. Louis. Now, perhaps more so than any other pilot that ever walked into the Air and Space Museum, Lindbergh felt a very close relationship to the spirit of St. Louis. And although it's a little bit hard as it's hanging here in the milestones of flight, periodically for maintenance, we have to bring the, spacecraft, the aircraft down to the ground. And then you can kind of sneak a, a look inside of it. And you really feel Lindbergh's presence in there. For one, he had to take uh, very meticulous notes on his fuel consumption and which wing he was borrowing fuel from. And to keep track of all of that stuff, he didn't notch everything down on a piece of paper, which could maybe have been blown out the window in the middle of the Atlantic and then he'd really been lost. Instead, what he did is he wrote everything down on pencil on the actual instrument panel. So you can still look inside there today and see the pencil marks that he wrote on the instrument panel during his flight. Now, the other interesting story about Lindbergh is that when he was still alive and before the Air and Space Museum actually opened, Spirit of St. Louis was hanging up in the Arts and Industry Building. And after the museum closed at night, he would uh, approach Paul Garber, who was the curator for, for the Spirit of St. Louis, and, as well as the aviation artifacts at the time, and asked if he couldn't be lifted up into the airplane. They they would bring in a ladder or a cherry picker and put let Lindbergh go up into the airplane and sit there and presumably meditate for you know over an hour or something. I've heard that story from from Garber and I've heard it from other curators here, but that's sort of the connection that Lindbergh felt to the spirit of St. Louis, and so much so that he called his second book We. And it's also sort of a reflection, too, that he didn't, everybody, you know, Lindbergh was known as the Lone Eagle, but Lindbergh never really felt that he did this by himself. It was a technological achievement that the airplane actually represented, but also it was a team effort that the Ryan Corporation went in uh, to building the airplane, but also the financiers that he had in St. Louis that allowed him to, to put this whole thing together. And Lindbergh never really forgot that, although most of the public just saw uh, Lindbergh as a hero and, you know, the, the Lone Eagle. Now, the other artifact I wanted to talk about, too, is the Apollo 11 command module. Now, it's kind of easy to forget um, sort of the closeness that an astronaut might, astronaut might feel to their particular space, spacecraft, particularly since, you know, they only really fly it for about a, a week to, to 10 days uh, or up to two weeks sometimes. But they're training in it. They have to get to know the feel for the, the spacecraft while it's sitting there on the ground. Uh, their relationship with that spacecraft goes way before the flight actually starts. And uh, one of the things that Michael Collins did after the Apollo 11 flight was he actually went back into the, the spacecraft and wrote a little note. Um, and he describes that in his book, Carrying a Fire. He says, um, perhaps NASA might like to fly men to Mars and perhaps I could help them plan it somehow. In the meantime, best focus on the business's hand, if there is any. 
For one thing, it doesn't seem right to abandon Colombia without a backward glance. Our president in it should be marked somehow. I am not normally emotional about machines, and I consider graffiti the ex exclusive province of morons and train stations. Despite all that, however, I feel a powerful urge to write on Columbia somehow. Finally, on the second evening, well, this is back when uh, they've been recovered and he's sitting on the Hornet on the way back to Hawaii, I climbed back on board his charred carcass, and on the wall of the lower equipment bay, just above the sextant mount, I write, Spacecraft 101, alias Apollo 11, alias Columbia, the best ship to come down the line. God bless her, Michael Collins, CMP. And here's a picture of that little note that he wrote inside the spacecraft. It's not something you can see easily, even when the plexiglass is off. You actually have to physically be in the, the spacecraft to see it. But I'll pass this around for everybody so you can take a look at it. Um, now, the, what I'd like to do is talk about two other artifacts on the other side of the building down here by Lunar Exploration. So if everybody could kind of follow me and march down that way, I'd appreciate it. Now, sometimes people ask me when they find out what it is I do here, they ask me what my favorite artifact is. And I, I love working here. And I love the fact that we have all these artifacts and the history that they represent. So sometimes I think that when they ask me that, I think that question is a little bit like asking me which one is my favorite kid. But if I had a closeness to a particular artifact, it would probably be Lunar Module 2, just because of the fact that I'm a geologist and a planetary geologist. And that was the, the spacecraft that actually brought people down to the lunar surface. Now, as a, a part of the uh, Apollo anniversary activities in July, this is kind of a personal story myself, I was asked to, to give a curator's choice on Lunar Module 2. Now, one of the people that was in the crowd, very much like you guys, was sitting there mouthing off a lot of facts about the Lunar Module, and I could tell he really knew his stuff. And I suspected at the time he was probably a docent, because we have a lot of really good docents here that really know their stuff. But I'd never seen him before. And he came up to me afterwards, and it turns out that this guy's name was Mar Rosenberg, and he was actually the engineer that worked for Grumman, who was uh, assigned to do the testing for lunar module, uh, the lunar modules there at Johnson Space Center. And he now lives in the Washington area, and he saw that I was giving a talk on lunar module 2. He couldn't resist, so he attended my talk and came up to me afterwards and introduced himself. Now, prior to being on display at uh, the Smithsonian, the lunar module had only really been on display publicly in one other time. That was during the World's Fair in Japan. And at the time, Rosenberg was told that he was going to um, go to Japan and assemble the, the lunar module for this World's Fair. And he would put together all of the, the planning documents, shipping documents, designed a, a particular crate with an engineer there at uh, Johnson because uh, to, to ship parts of the lunar module to Japan, and then at the last minute he was told he couldn't go, but we'll have you there to bring it back, Marv. And then, of course, you know, some muckety-mucks above him wanted to go, so he didn't get to go again. So when the chance came to put lunar module 2 here at Washington, he jumped at it, and um, uh, I actually have a picture of him uh, in the A&I building right here on the, the ladder of the lunar module, and above him is Michael Collins, the first director of the Air and Space Museum. Now, it was nice being able to talk to him about lunar module 2 because he remembered a lot of the history of it and was able to explain some of the documents that we actually have in our collections that we really weren't able to make sense of. Now, one of the other mysteries that we have, when we put the new Kapton, the, the, the Mylar covering on the lunar module in time for the anniversary, we actually found a bottle of sherry hidden inside of it behind some of the wrappers. He didn't know anything about that. And his crew didn't leave it in there, so presumably it was whatever crew moved the Lunar Module 2 over to uh, Air and Space uh, from ANI, they're the ones that put it in there. But he told me a lot of other secrets uh, behind it. Um, now the final thing I wanted to talk about is uh, the M2F3. Now the M2F3, was actually originally the M2F2. Now, everybody who grew up in the, the 60s and 70s remembers the television show The Six Million Dollar Man. Well, The Six Million Dollar Man starts off replaying the wreck of the M M2F2. Uh, at the time, it was flown by a, a pilot named uh, Bruce Peterson. And uh, Peterson uh, essentially describes his accident in 
in detail. What had happened is that there was some oscillation in, in the vehicle itself as he was uh, coming into the, the runway. He regained control of, the, of the, uh, the aircraft prior to landing, but he was off course and he was heading to a helicopter. It was documenting uh, the, the actual flight itself. And to avoid colliding, he went off the runway and then all of a sudden, you know, he was on his, uh, a blank surface where there weren't any markings and he was unable to really judge his, his distance. He was starting to lower the landing gear and fire the rockets to, to, to land safely, but he was already too close to the ground, hit the ground, rolled over, and ended up doing uh, some damage. He broke his, his hand, presumably the hand that was on the stick at the time, uh, and messed up his face quite a bit too, knocked out some teeth, or busted some teeth, um, and um, was in the hospital for a year and a half recovering afterwards. Uh, the government never made uh, spent $6 million in... in and 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 uh, his recovery, but um, the writer Martin Caden, who wrote both fiction and nonfiction at the time, was somewhat aware of what was going on there with the lifting body program, and and was thinking about this whole idea of the the uh, a book called Cyborg about a test pilot who actually loses two arms, a leg, and an eye uh, in an accident, and the government actually rebuilds him into the super spy. Um, Peterson really didn't like the idea that his wreck was played over and over again every every week uh, and kind of complained about it for a long time. He'd done a lot of great things, and it was just that one moment that, where he, he said, I had a bad day, that everybody got to see over and over again. Um, so sometimes the, the, the memories and the attachments that particular pilots have to, uh, to aircraft or artifacts in our, our collection aren't always that favorable. The M2F Two was recovered and, like Peterson, was rebuilt. They probably spent more than six million dollars on rebuilding it into the M2 F3, but uh, that is the same space the aircraft that was flown and uh, seen in the opening credits of the Six Million Dollar Man. That's all I had, guys. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you for listening to this edition of Ask an Expert. A companion question and answer session for this lecture may also be available. For a schedule of upcoming Ask an Expert lectures at the museum, please visit www.nasm.si.edu.